This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. And welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Wherever the case may be, where you happen to be on this lovely Sunday in LA, it's a gorgeous day at 9 a.m. And we're here, we're here for your pets. Uh, so anything you want to ask now is your chance. You're live with Dr. Jeff Werber here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. And um, so you know, it's it's this is your chance, really, when you think about it. Um, how how often do you get free advice? That's what I want to know, or advice that's worth anything. So anyway. Now's the time. You can get a hold of us. Uh, call us toll free 888-877-385-8882. Or you can, excuse me, it's 877-385-8882. 877-385-8882. A lot of eights in there. Eight seven sevens in there. Or better yet, <laughs> join us live here on Zoom. You go on to PetLifeRadio.com. Click on Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff under Shows. And there'll be a link left there for you. Just click on the link and you can join us here live. So as you know, I usually start perusing the news, but today, as uh, last week, we have a very special guest. Um, and this special guest is Molly Baser. Molly is uh, a client of mine for many, many, many years. 20. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, is, uh, has a, a, a very interesting viewpoint about our pets and how to treat them, how to feed them. Um, I, truth be told, she is herself vegan. She's one of the healthiest people I know. She does teaches yoga. She does all sorts of things. She's all over the place. But also very importantly, really, and this is, this is with pets in mind, this is what is so impressive, is that um, Molly is running for a uh, councilman position or council person position, District 5, here with the LA City Council. And uh, she's her, one of her platforms, her main platform, is really creating a strong animal welfare program for the city of Los Angeles. And this is repeatable. And so many times when I report on certain things happening in different municipalities, I say, you know what? You should take this to your city council members, and you can do the same thing in your cities. Why is, you know, for example, how many times have I reported lately how many cities, how many municipalities are stopped selling pet shop puppies from puppy mills and only allow rescue dogs in pet stores? These are things that just happen over time, but they happen because of people like Molly. So Molly, welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Now, well, you said everything <laughs> that I wanted to say. <laughs> so, no, no, yeah. but we, I want to talk specifics. I want no, to talk. No, I know. Well, I, I, I'm joking. How, how did you, you know, look, obviously many of us are pet lovers. And by the way, we have a, Enid. Enid Dunkelman is uh, waiting, I guess, to, I don't know whether to ask a question. Um, Enid, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just listening. She's okay. listening. Okay. Um, so um, what you... Um, so we all love our pets. I mean, and, and clearly I know you do as well, but um, wh where did you get this, this, this drive to do more than just be a pet lover, pet mom? Well, uh, it, you know, years ago I became an animal. Well, first I became a vegan. I watched a video um, about health. that was first for my health. And, um, and then I saw they had a section in this documentary of how the animals were treated. And I just would not, I made a decision that day, uh, I would not partake in any violence towards animal uh, for my food, for what I wear, for products that I use, so forth and so on. And then I, I joined PETA. I began to march with them and, and do activism ac actions. And then, so it's been this evolution. And then I did a whole wellness program with health and, you know, yoga and vegan cooking. And then I started seeing, well, okay, we have a healthy body, but our planet's dying. And so it took me now into wanting to have a bigger voice for the animals, for the planet, for a the people. So to me, it's all connected. And then I thought, you know what, for a bigger platform, I need to run for office. And city council was a great place to start. And I want to help my community and my neighbors. And one of my, like I said, my platforms is to clean up the shelter system and help the animals. And so that is, that has been my journey. Um, and I have now all rescue animals um, that Jeff takes care of. <laughs> Nancy, my three-legged pit bull, 
who had just had a major surgery. Well, I don't know if it was major. So I just, you know, I continue whatever I can to help. That's what I want to do. And, um, you know, I was reading last night, I was doing some research on our shelter system and it's just, we can do better in the wealthiest city, one of the wealthiest cities in the world. We can do better for not just the animals, for the people. And like I said, and the planet, but it, you know, um, I'm sure you've heard this before, but Mahatma Gandhi says the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the manner in which its animals are treated. And I think that is so true because it starts there and how we treat our animals is how we treat each other, how we treat our homeless. I mean, we can do better in all areas. And now on the, on the, uh, the animal front. And I know that, you know, it, Interesting. We don't wish COVID on, on anybody. And yet what is done for our shelter system here has been somewhat of a plus in that for whatever reason, more and more people are going out, getting out and they are yeah. adopting. Um, I, I, you know, in the last year and few months, I've adopted three shelter, you know, rescue pets oh, and, nice. um, and, um, and they're phenomenal. I, you couldn't get a better pet. And I got three of them. Uh, my six cats, all rescues. So I am, uh, and I look, I used to be, and I still am. I love Labradors. I, as you know, I love my French Bulldogs. I have a lab, um, but, but you know, they're, they're, they're now they pale in comparison to the number of rescues I have. So, and I, and I, and I, 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 I fear, I really do that when this uh, whole COVID uh, insanity is finally oh. ending, that many, many people, it's almost like, you know, like the movie, 101 Dalmatians. Every time that, that is re-released or re-released or re-re-released, guess what? People get Dalmatians because it makes them look so good. And they, yeah, they're fun. They're cute. But they're not always such good pets. And people realize that, oh, my God, I'm going to have this dog. Now what? And, and all of a sudden, the shelter is inundated right. with Dalmatians. So. We want to stop that. We want people to, to, as Molly said, to really start appreciating and learning how we should treat our animals. And Molly, you and I talked about what's going on. Was it in um, uh, Finland? Ne Netherlands. Netherlands. Would you tell us what, what, what you've read? I think that's very interesting. So the Netherlands has completely gone. They have no stray animals any longer. And what they did, and Netherlands is about a country of about 17 million. So that we have, I looked up last night, uh, we have about in the county of LA, 10 million, and then in the city three. So what, we have 13 mil million. Um, we're one of the most, yeah, the most populated cities in the country. So what they did is though they had, they placed, they, they made laws more stringent. Um, they've, you have to sterilize your animal. They made those processes also free. Um, so nobody has to pay for it. They also started a police force that, in, you know, you get you, if you abuse an animal or abandon an animal, you are, uh, you have to pay a fee of a thousand dollars and then you can get imprisoned for three years. So, and they put a tax on, if you buy a dog, they just put a huge tax on that. So people start, stop buying and they start going to the shelters. So they, they had this whole system, but the government implemented all these various avenues to create this, you know, no more stray animals and they don't euthanize. So that we euthanize so many animals in this city. And that's what I was thinking. We love our pets. And yet we're, we have the system where we euthanize them. We kill thousands. Um, so I just think if the Netherlands can do it, we can do it here in the city of Los Angeles. And I believe that. And I think we can, it's, it's just about coming together and creating solutions, which things get gridlocked because of bureaucracy and money and all this other stuff. But I believe there is a way. Now, what about, so where, where do we stand now? Who, who, um, as far as policies, have you seen them? I mean, look, LA has made some pretty good steps when you think about it. I yes. Mean, just outlawing, outlawing pet shops that sell puppy mill dogs. Right. I mean, That's true. You know, and, and many, many, many municipalities are now following suit because they, they also see a, the benefits to the pets and, and the success. It's been very successful. Uh, we still have a big shelter problem. Um, 
you know, it, it is concerning that they're, uh, I mean, years ago when I used to report about things like this, um, the statistic was, and this is really, really frightening, that a pet was put to sleep in the United States every three seconds. Oh, uh, I know. It was un. Can you imagine every three seconds another dog or cat or sub pet is being killed, and and you know that's that's um, I think inexcusable. And I do work with a lot of rescues, and I, and I got to tell you, look, rescue groups are doing the best they can. They are they're always short of funds, which is they're always short of space. The only rescue um, that I work with that say, look, we will help you find a home for this dog, but you need to find a place for it because our shelter, our rescue is full. Right. We, we cannot take any more. We can meet you at the park. We can go to these rescue. You can, if you handle your own dog, we will allow you to be part of our rescue, but you have to do the legwork because we are, we're full. We're running out of volunteers, running out of money, and more importantly, running out of space. So, you know, it's something that we, we need to do a better job. I totally agree. Um, but you know, it's also interesting is the philosophy of some of the rescues. And I work with a number of them. And one of them, interestingly, I go check in their pets. Now, their pets are, are you know, the three-legged ones. You know what I mean? They are the ones that are, that are 14 years old. They're the ones that have no teeth in their mouth. I know. The ones, right? And yet, why are you rescuing? And they said, there is a match for every single dog. Right. And, and, and it's, it, whereas they, many of the other rescues, and I, again, it's, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody because everybody has their niche. Some of the rescues would walk right by that dog and say, you know, look, we need to get, we need to get dogs that are very adoptable, that, that are easily adoptable. They have to be cute. And they're a per, great personality, which is true. That's, that's how I got mine. I fell in love with them when they were brought into my hospital just for, for, for checkups. Um, but there are people out there. You know, you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, that, that Molly has both her legs, but you know how many people will adopt a three-legged dog because they themselves have lost a limb? Wow, I didn't know that. Oh my God, yes. There's that, there's that instant connection. And, and so it's so interesting. So there, there is, typically there is a match. Person who, who wants, who loses a spouse in their 80s, okay? And the statistics show that, that those that live with a pet are going to live way longer after the loss of a, of a loved one, after yes. a spouse, right? So you're going to get a dog. They don't want to get a puppy. They don't have the energy for a puppy. Oh my God, but that 14-year-old dog who just wants to sit on their lap, yeah. that's perfect. So, you know, it's a matter of finding the right match. So what else can we do? I think it's about education, but what else can we do from the, 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 the city side, from political side to help these animals? Well, we, um, we need to vote in political leaders that are take strong stance on animal welfare. And Paul Koretz, who, was, is the, who is terming out in the district where I'm running, he had a great... Um, program. I mean, he was big, big pro animal. Yes, he was. Uh, yes. yes. So um, we need, we need stronger, we need politicians who are going to bat for the animals. And I mean, Garcetti, who says, you know, a lot, there's a lot of talk, which I was reading last night. He says that LA is no kill, which is not true at all. Um, so I, I just found that interesting because I think he said that, you know, I don't know, because people want to hear that, but we have to actually put in a law that to make it no kill, make it uh, very difficult to buy a pet, but people go out of state. That's part of the problem. But where we just, and our shelter systems are clean, cleaned up. People get rescue animals rather than purchasing. Um, and if our leaders are doing that and constantly talking about it, they, it changes occur. You know, right. but, um, and, and so that's, we need to have leaders who are leading on this and that's where I am. And I'm going to be very vocal about it as part of my platform. You know, it's the animals, it's the people, it's all of it, but well, I, I hope you're not going to stop restaurants from serving fish and meat. <laughs> no, I couldn't <laughs> pass that anyway. All right, real quick. Uh, we're going to break real quick. When you come back, I, in, 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 in really in line with what Molly just said, I have to tell you about one of my morning calls this morning on AirVet that blew my mind and why what, what Molly is saying is so important. So anyway, don't go way back. We come back. We're going to talk about this little cute little puppy that came from Iowa.
Oh. And if that doesn't ring a bell right there, where where in Iowa it came and how it was bred, then we'll uh, you'll be a, <laughs> you'll be a big surprise. Anyway, don't go away. Be right back after these short words. Here we are live, Dr. Jeff Werber at Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Werber, special guest Molly Basler, and we are talking about um, all things pets. And uh, Molly is running for the uh, an LA City Council position, District Five. Uh, to replace an incumbent who also, by the way, um, was, uh, is a good animal advocate, which is fantastic. So anyway, we were talking about um, the, you know, outlawing these, these pets that are for sale and bred pets. And as we know, they're coming mostly from the Midwest. They are puppy mills uh, extraordinaire, unfortunately. And that's what they do. So I, I took a call this morning on AirVet and it was a dog. It was picked up yesterday. They drove 200 miles to pick up the dog. Uh, they live near uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and they drove to Iowa to pick up the dog. And the dog was a bouncy puppy, little, you know, cute, cute, cute. And this morning, the puppy can barely get up, doesn't want to get out of its cage. Um, little puppy, uh, and and uh, I think it's um, eleven weeks. They said, and um, uh, I, I so asking such questions. Look, all these things could happen. I mean, vomiting and diarrhea. So it could be just nerve stress, anxiety. You know, new home, dry, long drive, different food, different environment. That could do it. Um, parasites certainly, but it was wormed. In fact, in fact, listen to this. Yesterday, they said before it left the breeder. Um, it was it was having some diarrhea and they put it on a medication called Albon, which is for coccidia. Did they do a fecal check? Of course not. So they just started Albon, assuming, because that's all it's good for is coccidia. It's not good for any other of the parasites. Then, um, so I said, let me see um, the vaccine record. They show me a vaccine record. This is what drives me nuts. Okay, ready for this? The first vaccine given at four and a half weeks of age followed nine days later by another, and five days later by another. Now, talk about A, not only inappropriately using a vaccine at, at four and a half weeks, you don't need to start a vaccine until minimum seven weeks. Eight weeks is better, and you only need three, eight, 12, and 16. By giving, uh, then the next one, nine days later, a parvo, they gave a distemper parvo, then a parvo, and then another distemper parvo, 14 days later, nine and five. Well, that is so, un not only is it unnecessary, it is actually damaging. It is wow. dangerous for that puppy. Why? Because those early vaccines, given that age where the puppy has no chance of mounting its own immune response, I mean, right. is only relying on mom's immunity, passive immunity from they were bred. And now when you give a vaccine that young, the, the uh, mom's passive antibodies just eat up that, the, those antigens. And now the puppy's left with nothing. And it's too young to make its own. Right. So it is, it, not only is it a waste, not only is it not necessary, it's actually dangerous. And so I asked her, I said, what was this? What, 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 tell me about the establishment you got it. Well, it was just, it was someone's home. They did have a lot of dogs running around. They're all the same breed. Um, and it was like, it's just an older couple. And I said, oh my God, this is the description, the classic description of a puppy mill. Puppy mill, yep. And they know nothing. And let me tell you something. I have tried, look, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm in my 37th year of doing this. And I started working with pet shops and puppies and helping puppies from the time I started practicing. And I realized that all the, the, the mistakes that a lot of these breeders were making. So look, I couldn't change the world. I'm not Molly. I'm not gonna be able to do that, which she's gonna do. She wants to run. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> They'll do it, that's great. But I would, I would do one at a time. So I would call these breeders and say, you know what? I looked at so your puppy is very cute, but you know, in the future you may not. And I'm trying to explain the new way of how we see vaccines, when they should be started. It's no longer six, eight and 10 weeks or eight, 10, 12 weeks. It's now eight, 12, 16 weeks. And, and you don't wanna give them too early. You don't wanna give them too early. And they go, and this is what I get. I'm, I, I pardon those of you whose accent I may uh, duplicate, but it's because they're usually from this, these areas. And it's a, look, son, I've been doing this for over 40 years. I know what I'm doing and I'm not going to stop. I'm doing exactly because my pups are healthy. Wow. And it's like, I'm thinking, oh my God, don't you want to learn? I remember the parting words that one of my mentors in vet school, because I was a hotshot in vet school and I thought I knew everything and I almost, I'm just kidding. And, uh, and, uh, but she said to me, look, Jeff, understand one thing. Every five years, half of what was gospel is Changes. obsolete. Right. So don't think you know it all because you may right now, today, but five years from now, they're going to be laughing at you. And if you don't learn to change and stay up 
on new things. And, and, and I mean, I look at my old notes. I look at my, I still have my old textbooks. I'm a pack rat and I keep my old, I keep my old exams. And of course, to show them off to my kids who say I'm stupid. I want to show them that I wasn't always so stupid. And, and, um, and, and they, they, you know, I laugh at that stuff that we used to do that. We, there are drugs that they don't even make them anymore that I was using every day. So things change. So if you want to change the times. Molly, I had a question for you also. You said something, and this is where, and by the way, I agree with many, many, many of the things that you do. Um, since watching one of these specials, I'm not a vegan by any means, but I've certainly changed how I eat and what I eat. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more aware. I don't eat a lot of meat, period. But one thing that, that, that unnerves a lot of people, and, and, and I think that as you are promoting what you do, there's a difference between animal welfare, which I think we all agree is phenomenal, yes. and animal rights. And when you start dealing with animal rights activists, we call them humaniacs. And, and that, even though people may believe in your, 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 your philosophy, what you're trying to do, what you'd like to accomplish, it's not, it's not, it's like not what, it's what, not what you say, how you say it. It's the same thing. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. And when you start burning down laboratories and being like, like doing, being destructive and ruining people, that's not the answer. No, I know. That's why I tell my activist mm -hmm. friends, run for office. Mm -hmm. That's how we're going to make change from the bottom up is to get into positions of power where we can change the laws. That's what we need to do. Yes, I agree. I'm not burning down things. I'm, I, I, get, I let my voice be vocal, but I've not done that. I'm not a radical like that. So that's why I'm stepping into a position where I can actually change the laws and inspire people to do things differently. I think, you know, I am not a, a career politician. I'm an organizer. You know, I've, I'm an environmentalist. Uh, I organized the Green Dream campaign and I'm, you know, I have a podcast about the environment. And so I live and breathe what I do. So that's why I'm running, like I've said in the very beginning, to have a larger platform and create change without harming, uh, you know, society. I mean, right. I don't think that's the way you do it. But I also, when you said, Jeff, about learning and growing, one, I just going back to the Netherlands, I just was looking. Um, one of the other ways they also got rid of the stray dog and cat problem and animals um, without euthanizing is through educating and campaigns of educating people of what to do, where to go. And it was all government. And then there's a thing that I, I just wanted to say that it's called collect neuter, vaccinate, and return. So that was a program they also created. And education. So yes, I, that's why animal welfare is what I'm working on. We have changed laws here, but we need more. And we need more attention because the animal shelter system is sort of on the fringe. And not a lot of people know what's going on there. So I want also the animal shelters to be more transparent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, taxpayers, we pay for that. So I believe it's also a drain on the taxpayer. I mean, we pay, we pay $2 billion a year in the country for uh, gathering animals up, housing them, euthanizing them, and running the shelter system. So you bring that down to, they, it's interesting because I looked up how much it was costing taxpayers in the LA area for this. And you can also, where whatever city you're living in, you can look these things up. Uh, but they didn't have anything about like, what were the taxpayers paying for Los Angeles, the animal shelter. So it's also financially sustainable to have a shelter system that works and that isn't a drain on the taxpayer, isn't a drain on the system. It's just like our homeless issue. You know, it's a drain on everything to have any species that isn't taken care of. You know, what do you think about, and again, I'm, as I'm thinking about it, I'm also thinking how people are going to already, you know, ruin it. And that is having a fee, because we know that there's the average time stay that some of these shelters have, whether it's going to be euthanizing, right. which is terrible, or adoption. How about figuring out on a, what it costs per day and, and, and say, take the average and say, you know, to, if you want to relinquish a pet to the shelter, it's going to cost you. You have a financial responsibility right, to right. drop that Good dog idea. off. That's a great idea. I agree. And, yes. 
And and then and then we you know we'll we will take your dog we will but it it takes money it takes time it takes food and it takes manpower so we have a you know you want to drop a dog off it's a three hundred dollar fee so it'll be the last three hundred you'd ever spend on the dog but but what people will do they're just going to dump it the street yeah 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 that's true because and I've been at the shelters looking at dogs to rescue or to foster and you see people in the waiting room dropping their dogs off I like know. they're like they're a piece of furniture right. It, it, it is so heart wrenching. In fact, I, w- I just want to say something because Enid's on the line, and Enid is a great rescuer of cats. And Ma, I had a client. Well, that, don't let me meet her. I already have six, and I can't. <laughs> I think she has about six or seven. <laughs> but we were. But listen, a client of mine had an older cat, eighteen, Rocky, who I love. He has six paw, you know, six fingers. He's so mm-hmm. cool. He's this big tabby. He's old now, and they were gonna euthanize him and I said no way so I called Enid and Enid was willing to take this cat um, which I just thought was wow you talk about a champion for the animals and then we were going to deal with it and try to find it but Enid was willing to take that 18 year old Rocky although then Lois reneged and kept Rocky who's the you know it was the her kids because Lois is older and they thought the cat was too much trouble and Cat, but, boy, cats are easy. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> a so, Labrador puppy, then you'll have trouble. <laughs> but I just think it's wonderful that when people are willing to step up, because all life, whether it's an eighteen-year-old, a two-year-old, I, I, I think it's important. It's just like absolutely. People. Well, Molly, I wish you uh, best of luck. Um, and uh, for those of you who are in Los Angeles, um, uh, make sure you vote when you can. Uh, uh, when you are able to, when is it? When is this election anyway? When is this? It's happen? not for a while, but we're starting our platforms already and our campaign. So it's, it'll be in 2022. It'll be the mayor election. Okay. Also, the mayor will be running, and uh, attorney general. All of uh, there will be some other obviously elections. So then it will be city council in specific districts, but also whatever city you're in. Get educated on who is running your city and who is the animal champions. I mean, that's right. what we need. And people, animals, and planet. Those are the things. And usually if they're a champion for the planet, they're a champion for the animals. So perfect. All right. Thank you all for joining us. I thank think, you, Jeff, uh, so much. Molly, we'll see you soon. Um, uh, if you have any questions you want to get a hold of me, you can always get a hold of me here, Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. You can also get any help 24-7 on our, our um, AirVet animal platform, which is phenomenal. And um, uh, we will see you here next week. Um, Mark, I, we, I don't know if we're live, but we have a show for you next week. Molly. Um, may I say one thing? Sure. If you want to reach me, you can go to Molly2022.com. Molly2022.com. And, uh, and that's, if you have any questions, again, you don't have to be in Los Angeles just to get ideas yeah. about what you can do in your communities to make a difference. This is the kind of person, Molly is the person to talk to because she's not only has been there, done that, she's doing it right now. So uh, that's very important. All right. So uh, have a great week and we will see you soon.